people might go out. So, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Steve Ferber. Professor Steve Ferber is a professor at Manchester University. Anybody who's uh, in their mid 40s, as I am, may well uh, have been introduced to computing by, by Steve's work. Uh, anybody who's, how many people have used the model A or B, 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 C, D? Oh, there we go, right. <laughs> And of course, anybody who's got a mobile phone quite possibly has an arm chicken. So I think Steve is, is someone who, who really doesn't need any big announcements and introduction. So I'm going to not uh, take up any more of your time. So okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the background to me being here giving this seminar is, is uh, I first gave this talk at the CPHC um, conference or symposium in York back in April. And the CPHE conference is so popular that nobody from UCL was there apart from Anthony, I think. <laughs> and Anthony, Anthony was there and, 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 and asked me if I'd come to UCL to give it again where he hoped a few more of you might turn out. I think. Was, was that the plan? That's right. That's <laughs> <laughs> and this has worked. So um, uh, this is basically a, a research seminar on computers and brains and the current project which I'm leading at Manchester. Um, but before we get going on that, um, I guess everybody in this room will be aware that this year is notable for being uh, the year of the London Olympics and, and other things, the year when Andy Murray finally won uh, one of the open sets, but also the centenary of, 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 of Chorin's birthday. And, and um, the picture on the left here is a fairly unremarkable semi-detached house on the outskirts of Wilmslow, about a mile from where I live. Um, and it's quite a long way back from the road, so not many people know this. Um, but actually, where well, you can't read it from the road, there's a blue plaque, and, and this is the house where uh, Turing uh, lived during his time in Manchester um, and died. Um, and if anybody's interested, the house is currently on the market. Um, <laughs> so if you want to buy a bit of computing history, um, it's on the market for £950,000, which even for Wilmslow is a bit steep for a semi, I have to say. Um, and what, what I haven't been able to establish is, is whether the history of the house is actually adding anything to the value. I have a horrible feeling it isn't. Um, it looks like the patch. No, no, it's... it's there's, bilat there's bilateral symmetry, and there are two front doors. Um, Yes. So the price is for half of it. The price is just for the left half, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and it says here, Alan Shoring, founder of computer science and cryptographer, whose work was key to breaking the wartime Enigma codes, uh, lived and died here. Um, and we had a very exciting Turing Centenary Conference in Manchester back in June, actually on his birthday itself. Um, where for me at least the exciting bit was, was watching Gary Kasparov um, play Turing's chess program. Now Turing wrote a chess program in the 1930s and, and, and you'll immediately spot the odd thing about that. Is that there were no programmable computers in the 1930s. Uh, that didn't stop Turing writing the program. Um, I have to say Gas uh, Kasparov beat it rather easily. Um, but I guess that's understandable when you couldn't even run this program. Um, anyway, slightly re relevant to this talk is that while he was in Manchester, um, Turing principally worked on his biological research in, in uh, sort of mathematical basis of morphogenesis. Um, but he also wrote this paper that's become fairly uh, memorable um, in, amongst computing circles and also has seeped out into the general public, uh, which is his paper on computing machinery and intelligence, um, where he starts with the question, can machines think? Um, and of course then goes on to recast this question into the imitation game, um, which we now, or the, the general public now, knows as the Turing test, which is, could you construct a scenario where a human can't tell if they're communicating with another human or with a computer. Um, and it's interesting that, that um, this challenge is, is still out there. 
there's lots of debate amongst this community about whether it's the right way to pose the question. Um, but it's still up there as a challenge that we've not really um, been able to fully address to everybody's satisfaction um, with computers. And what I'm going to talk about um, isn't a solution to this. Um, I'm not going to give you any good answers to any deep questions. Um, but it is coming back to the question as, as, as to what does thinking mean and how does the only thing that we know of, that we know thinks, which is the human brain, how does it do it? What do we need to do to understand natural intelligence before we start thinking about um, what's required for artificial intelligence in the sort of strong sense? Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I want to give you a bit more of a history lesson. Um, I'm a computer engineer, okay, so my um, principal experience is in the area of building bits of hardware, so I'm going to teach you some facts about hardware, um, and then talk about computer architecture and get on to this idea that we might use computers to build models of brains, and, and they are one of the tools, one of the instruments we can use to try and understand what's happening uh, inside our heads and you know, what's the foundation of human intelligence. Um, then I'm going to get on to some technical architecture stuff, looking a little bit inside the machine we're building, <coughs> where the hard bits are, and tell you where we've got to, which of course is nowhere near answering the questions I started off asking. Uh, so just to sort of control expectations at the start of the talk, um, you've only got so far. So 63 years of progress. What, what's this about 63 years? Well, I'm from Manchester. Um, not only do I work at the University of Manchester, but I was actually born and brought up um, and went to school in Manchester, so um, I have strong links with the place. Um, and one of Manchester's claims to fame um, is that it was where the first computer program was run. So the Manchester Baby was the first machine in the world um, that implemented this idea of a computer that stored its instructions in its own electronic memory and it could manipulate them itself. Now, um, when I first went to Manchester, there were still echoes of the original Manchester Cambridge um, contentions of how claims to who did the first what, when, and why. Um, and, uh, so, you know, first claims are all, always have to be taken a little bit carefully. Um, and Cambridge can rightfully claim to have built the first usable programmable computer. Um, in the sense that the baby machine, when it ran its first program on June 21st, 1948, um, had a memory of 32 32-bit words. So it was a 1,000-bit main memory. Um, and so what you could do with it is, is, is quite restrictive. It's still highly educational to work out how to program it. And occasionally we run programming competitions for the baby. And, and people can do very interesting things in 32, 32 big words. Uh, remember those 32 words are not only the program, but if you want graphical output, they're also the graphics. Okay? Um, Any I, act didn't do that at all. Sorry? Any act didn't do that. Any act. Didn't, didn't, couldn't run the program? No. Uh, which one was ENIAC? Yeah, uh, the, the one this, that Aberdeen. This was the American. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, was, it, was, it, it took technicians three days to rewire it to change its program. Mm -hmm. all, all precursors of the baby machine and then EDSAC. Now, the, of course, the, the idea of building a, a programmable machine um, can be traced back to, to John von Neumann, or as Maurice Wiltz once told, told me we should call it, the von Neumann Eckert and Morkley machine, or architecture, because it wasn't just von Neumann. Um, you can see why that didn't catch on. I, I, um, I don't want to disturb the Zuno or the name. Zeus said as well, even in the 30s, was talking about this. Yeah, yeah. So, so Conrad Zeus gets largely neglected by the historians because he was German. Um, and, you know, that's not a good time to be German. Um, Anyhow, sorry. But yes, so, so there, are, there are complications there. And of course, you know, we, we now think that the idea goes back to Turing's work on, on computability and the universal Turing machine. Um, and, and 
if you talk to people about how uh, the extent to which Turing's idea fed into this machine, um, you get all sorts of different views, and history is still being rewritten. Uh, because there is a link between you know, Turing, Blech de Part, Max Newman, and the Manchester machine, and then there's this big argument actually inside Manchester about how much influence Newman and the mathematicians had on what was actually made. Because um, the, the, sort of the, 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 the fact about the Manchester baby is that it was not built to be a computer. Right? It was built because um, Kilburn and uh, Williams had this idea for digital storage, which was the cathode ray tube storage mechanism. And they wanted to build a test bed to see if this thing would work in a live environment. And the simplest way they could think of of building it a, a, an at speed test for this cathode ray tube storage was to build, embody it in a small computer. So the computer was kind of a second order objective in this work. They were really interested in the memory. And the memory did sort of go on to contribute to IBM adopted the Williams Kilburn tube. Um, their products later on in the 50s. Anyway, um, okay, I've clearly struck some chords on the, on, the, on the historical debate. That wasn't by intention at all. Um, I was just trying to say there was this computer in Manchester in 1948. Okay, uh, that, 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 that's all I want to say about that. Um, and 63 years later, um, there's this computer designed in Manchester. Well, actually, the computer bit is an arm, so maybe that was designed in Cambridge. Um, but the overall computer was designed in Manchester, and it's on the system I'm going to say quite a lot about later. But for the time being, it's just a typical modern embedded processor. It's the kind of processor you'd find in your phone or your camera or anywhere like that. And the point I want to make is that in only just over half a century, computers have changed a lot. Now, this is an obvious point, but it's worth quantifying. So the physical size is an obvious difference. The baby machine was in seven foot high post office racks, about the width of this screen, so you know, about this high and um, the front of this room, big. It used about three and a half kilowatts of electrical power, and with that, it would execute 700 instructions a second. The Spinnaker CPU, a typical modern um, embedded processor, is physically tiny. It occupies about three and a half square millimeters of silicon on a fairly old process that we use, 130 nanometer CMOS. It uses about 40 milliwatts of electrical power, and with that, it will execute some 200 million instructions a second. Okay? Now, um, one thing that's interesting here is, is I've used the word instruction <coughs> twice, and do I mean the same thing? And, and what I find interesting is that basically, yes, I do. That an instruction on the baby was something like a 32-bit binary subtract, and that's an instruction on the arm. I use subtract rather than add because the baby didn't actually have an add instruction. Um, so the, the arm has a rather richer instruction set. Uh, the baby has seven basic instructions, and the arm has got some uh, excessive number these days. Um, but basically, an instruction is still what it was 63 years ago. It's do something with two binary numbers, jump to this location in the program, load this thing from memory. That's what an instruction is. So these instructions are, to a first approximation, comparable. And the change in physical size is obvious, but I'm interested in the other two numbers. Because the other two numbers um, give you the energy efficiency of computation. And this is a very important characteristic of computers. The baby, if you just take the numbers off the previous slide, uses, used about five joules per instruction. And the modern processor uses something with lots of zeros after the decimal point. And if you take the ratio of those two numbers, <laughs> Then you get the very big number. Um, and in, in this particular case, the ratio is 25 billion, right? That's how much computers have improved in energy efficiency over just over half a century. Um, and it's a formidable rate of progress. Um, how do you think about this? Well, 
One example is the UK road transport fleet, all the cars, buses and lorries in the country, use about 50 billion litres of fuel a year. Okay? So if cars had improved at the same rate of computers, um, we could run the country off about two bottles of fuel per year, instead of requiring vast pipelines and super tankers and oil refineries. You know, two bottles would see us a year. Now I know there are good engineering reasons why it's much harder to make cars more fuel efficient than computers, but it, it, it just gives you a feel for the scale. Um, and of course a different topic is how long it's taken the car industry to start actually worrying about fuel efficiency, but that's a different matter. Um, <coughs> another thing I, I find interesting to think about um, with this number is imagine that the number on the screen here was 25 million rather than 25 billion. So improving the efficiency of a system by a factor of 25 million over half a century would seem like pretty good progress. We'd all be sitting back feeling fairly smug if we'd been involved in this process. But of course you wouldn't have mobile phones or digital cameras or portable music players because the battery life would just make them worthless. You just wouldn't buy any of that stuff. Um, so the fact that this number is as big as it is, is a major contributor to the um, prevalence of, of electronics across consumer products today. It's a vital, one of the vital components that means that we can now get computers everywhere. You know, the number of ARM processors shipped to date um, is roughly four for every person on the planet. It's, it's uh, well, about a year ago it passed the 30 billion mark. Um, and it's still growing. I don't know where they're all going, but I trust you've all seen it as your personal duty to consume your four ARM processors per year to keep the business rolling. Um, oh yes, the, 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 other, the other little Manchester link I'd like to point out here is, is, is the man with the rather grand beard. Um, gave his name to the unit of energy that we've chosen here, and James Prescott Jewell was born in Salford, which I think I'm far enough away from home I can get away with saying he's part of Manchester. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a risky comment too close to home, um, partly because there are two football teams involved in this distinction. Did you know that? Did you know that Manchester United isn't in Manchester? Uh. <laughs> um, anyway, what, what's made this possible has, has been a set of factors um, of which the best known is this thing that we now call Moore's Law. Um, Gordon Moore, back in 1965, uh, wrote his paper where he predicted <coughs> that the number of transistors that could be integrated on a microchip um, would double every, well, time constant there in a bit, but 18 months to two years. And in 1965, he confidently predicted that this doubling would continue for 10 years. So Moore's Law was written in 65. He didn't call it Moore's Law, he wasn't quite that arrogant, um, but it, it, it became known as Moore's Law, and it ended in 1975. And what you see is it's just gone on and on and on and on. Um, and it's gone on with suspicious precision. You know, this is uh, the kind of data where if you plotted this as a result of your A-level physics experiment, um, you'd lose marks for obviously having cheated. Um, because no real experiment follows the line that closely. But, but of course what happened is that from the mid 70s onwards, Moore's Law changed from being an observation of what was happening to the basic planning tool that decided what would happen. And um, today, if you want to know what the chip industry is going to look like for the next 15 years, you can download from the internet a very impressive document called the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. Um, it's about 800 pages of all the technical challenges facing chip progress and predictions of where the technology will be. Um, and at the heart of this is Moore's Law. That's the basic exponential around which the whole of ITRS is wrapped. Um, there are formidable challenges in delivering that, uh, but the industry still thinks that's where it's going. And in addition to this exponential rise in the number of transistors, there's been a corresponding exponential drop in the cost of a transistor. So in the 1950s, transistors, when they first emerged, were about $500 each. 
and now you can get about 100 billion of them to the dollar or something. Um, and again, cost has been an important factor. Now, exponentials in technology um, never go on forever. And what's slightly disconcerting is, of course, that today, nobody who's employed in the semiconductor industry has ever known anything other than exponential growth. Um, and so they may not be prepared for what's going to happen next. Um, but there are already signs that, that, that the time constant in Moore's law is beginning to stretch out. <coughs> so it's not an exponential, it's a classic industry S curve and we're beginning to approach the top of this curve. There's, we obviously have to approach it at some point on current technology because you can keep shrinking transistors but atomic scales ultimately get in the way and you can't make transistors smaller than an atom. So there's some limit somewhere. And um, according to the experts in this area, which are Asnasnov's group at Glasgow, do a lot of work on modeling future transistor technologies. Um, some of the atomic level issues are already beginning to bite quite badly. And as you shrink, you go from a model of a transistor as a kind of continuous material to one that becomes a bit bitty, to one that, where the atoms become clearly visible and individually play a role. And to give you some idea where we are on this, um, Intel's current leading manufacturer is at 22 nanometer feature size, and you get five silicon atoms to the nanometer. So their transistors are now 100 atoms across. Um, and that still may seem like quite a lot if you imagine you know, it's 100 by 100 by 100, that's still a million atoms in, in the transistor region, very roughly speaking. Uh, but transistors are electrically controlled by dopants of a different species, and those dopants are diffused into the transistor um, at a level of a few parts per million. Okay? Five, six parts per million is the typical sort of dopant density. So if you've only got a million si silicon atoms, five or six parts per million, it really matters whether it's five or six, because it's going to be five or six atoms. And furthermore, it matters quite a lot where they land, okay? whether they're in the middle of the region or somewhere near the edge. And th these dopants are put in by diffusion, which is essentially a random process. So you know, effectively, there's a gas of dopants, and somebody takes a shotgun and blasts six atoms in somewhere, and uh, they land where they land. So the effect is that the, the base technology we use to build computers is going to become much less controllable um, and it's going to become much less reliable over the next decade. It's, this, is, this is quite short term now. And um, an Intel fellow, Shekhar Borka, has summarized this by saying that you know, the good news is in 10 years' time we will be able to make you 100 billion transistor chips. The bad news is that 20 billion of those won't work, a random 20 billion. And the worst news is that a further 10 million will leave the game in the first year of product life. Okay? So if you believe those numbers, we're looking at having to design systems that work with 20 or 30 percent component failure rates. And presently, we have, not, we have no idea how to do that. Um, in fact, I'm giving you a presentation on a machine where with the exception of the large memory arrays, everything else is mission critical. So I have millions of transistors delivering this picture. If any one of those fails, the presentation will be over. Right. The, chips, the checks, actually, sorry, the checks for producing computers in the 60s, where they had a 10 to 20 percent failure rate, and they actually had to design the computer around that. Yes. Well, we're going to have to do it again. Um, in fact, if you, if you, if you put, you know, if you type designing reliable systems and unreliable technology into Google, you find some quite interesting hits with names like John von Neumann at the top of them. Because back in the 1950s, when computers were made with valves or vacuum tubes, they were unreliable. And so they worried a lot about scaling up and, and the reliability problems that would ensue. But then transistors came along and basically reliability largely became forgotten. For decades. So we have problems at the technology level 
that are coming to bite over the next 10 years or so. At the higher level, um, this may be more familiar territory to some people in the room. Um, <coughs> we're also seeing big changes in the way computers are designed at the high level. And you know, about 10 years ago, the grand clock rate wars of the 1990s uh, came to an end. Those were fun days when the, the, the clock rate of your processor was the principal marketing tool. And design, to, uh, design teams in leading microprocessor designers were actually designing processors so they had a higher marketing clock rate, even if it didn't mean they went any faster, because that's how you sold them. Um, but it became clear that the emperor had no clothes in that path, and all the big companies threw in the towel at roughly the same time, said they couldn't make their clock rates any higher because the chips would melt. But instead, they had a, an alternative escape route, which is they could put more than one processor on a chip. So we'll go to slightly simpler processors, and we'll sell you two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16. And of course, so now your processors are marketed by how many cores they've got. And Moore's law, which still delivers more transistors, gives you more cores, which is all well and good, except in the general domain, nobody has a clue how to program these things. Okay, This has been a big problem for a long time. And the, general, the problem of general purpose parallelization has been middle mass and, and, and small victories won, but it's remained the holy grail of computer science as to how you use systems made of large numbers of components in parallel in a general application domain. But the interesting thing is there's now no choice. Okay? There is no other way forward other than to keep banging our head against this problem until we make little holes in it or find our way around or do something. Um, I have colleagues at Manchester, I have a colleague who retired last year who spent his entire career building parallel computers of various sorts. And he said his proud claim to fame was he knew more ways to build parallel computers that didn't work than anybody else. Um, which, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> what I find interesting, and I, again, I don't have a solution to this problem, okay? So, so don't get your expectations too high. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. It still sits there as one of the major challenges for computer science. What intrigues me is that, you know, assuming we do find some generic solution to this, some systematic way of using large numbers of processors for general purpose applications, then we're faced with an interesting choice, because then you can buy your next laptop you know, with 100 Intel processors on it, or for about the same cost, performance, and everything else, you could have a 1,000 simpler processors, a 1,000 ARM cores, let's say, uh, not to show any, any significant prejudice in the matter. Um, and, and it's interesting to ask, how would those two machines compare? Uh, and the answer is that they compare, they'd be roughly equal in terms of cost and in compute power, um, but the simple cores would give you about an order of magnitude improvement in energy efficiency. So an order of magnitude improvement in battery life. So it may be that, that the high-end processor designers, by forcing us, leaving us with no choice but to solve this problem, um, will find they have no market for their complicated processes when we fix it. Um, this is highly speculative. And you find, uh, and, and you know, you can argue that there are more sensible solutions, and in fact at the moment, one of the best trade-offs is, is perhaps to have a processor where you have one complex processor that's quite good at processing the threads that really refuse to parallelize, and then a bunch of smaller processors that uh, handle the stuff that does parallelize and handle it more efficiently. And some, so some sort of heterogeneous trade-off um, is a possible outcome too. But for the purposes of this talk, what I want to, you to imagine is that the problem has gone away. Um, we have a future where, in our typical computer, we have a limitless supply of free processors. We have more processors than we can ever know what to do with. Um, I suggest that free because processors are now incredibly cheap. The cost of designing an arm into your phone is a few cents. Um, and as in totally tending to zero, or whatever bond decides to set its minimum royalty at. Um, because that's all you really cost you now, is what you have to pay on for the rights to use their design. Um, 
If you have a very large supply of processors, then the historic bugbear of parallel programming goes away because load balancing simply ceases to be an issue. You just bring more processors into play um, as you can use them, retire them when you can't, um, and they're free so it doesn't matter if they're not doing anything. Historically, processors were expensive and so you had to make good use of them, which meant they all had to work fairly hard. If they're free, you can stop worrying about that. And what I suggest is, if, if, if load balancing has ceased to be an interesting metric, um, you need some other way of deciding when you're doing a good job. And I suggest that increasingly the right metric um, is the energy that's required to perform the computation. You have to meet time constraints and so on. But once you've done that, what you should be optimizing is energy. Now, energy has been slowly growing up the computing agenda. Um, it's now got all the way to the top. Okay, so the biggest single challenge for the designers of the next generation of high-performance computers at Exascale is energy. If you build an Exascale machine with today's petascale technology, the petascale machines use um, 10, 20 megawatts of power. If you, ex if you simply scale that up to exascale, you're talking 10, 20 gigawatts. Okay, 10, 20 gigawatts is a row of about 10 nuclear power stations to run your computer. Um, I confidently predict that this isn't going to happen. Not even in America. <laughs> um, and so what, what they're worrying about, even at the very high end, is energy efficiency. And if you look at the energy efficiency targets that you need to meet to hit exascale performance at a sensible power consumption, exascale being 10 to the 18 of nearly everything, um, you, need, you actually need much better energy efficiency than we can currently deliver even in your mobile phone. So um, there are huge challenges in, in designing those targets. Um, so energy, is, I believe, is the prime metric. It's not as silly as it sounds. If you buy a PC today, work it fairly hard for its useful life of three years, you'll find you've spent more in electricity to power it than it cost you to buy in the first place. So, so energy is already beginning to dominate. Um, and with these vast processor systems, then you have to do a couple of things that, that most computer scientists find a bit difficult. Um, the first thing is you've got to eliminate unnecessary synchronization in the program because synchronization is what kills parallel machines. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means if you're modeling the airflow through a jet engine, the physics there is about local asynchronous interactions between particles of air. But what we do to formulate that into a computable problem is we discretize time and space and turn it into big matrices and then use matrix bashing to solve it. The problem is the matrix formulation introduces lots of synchronization that wasn't there in the original problem. So the question is, can you go back to the original problem and reformulate it in a way which captures the local asynchronous interaction rather than introducing synchronizations that you don't need? Um, <coughs> the slight downside to this approach, of course, is that it means that we lose one of the things that we kind of assume is a good feature of computer programs, which is they get the same answer if you run them twice. Okay? They become non-deterministic at this point. Each time you run it, you may get a slightly different answer. The same is actually true of what the computer program is replacing in most cases. So with the jet engine, if you run it in, the test, in a test rig in the lab and you take measurements, each time you run it, you get slightly different measurements. Okay? So we, it's not really a completely different world from the one we're used to although I'm not sure I'm yet quite ready to recommend this to my bank manager. Um, and what I want to talk about is it, it gives you a kind of reflection on how such systems might work, possibly. Um, so that moves on to my headline topic. Where am I doing? Yes. Um, building brains. I, I spent 30 years of my career, you know, building conventional processors in various shapes and sizes, um, why am I suddenly starting to talk about biology? Okay, that's a very good question. And the answer might be a midlife crisis. Um, or it might be because looking at this bit of biology, there are resonances here that suggest there might be answers that, that are usable um, in the context of computers. So brains are massively parallel. They exceed any parallelism we can um, even dream about in, in computers. They achieve this um, by using 
100 billion components inside your head with very large degrees of connectivity. Usual estimates are 10 to the 15 synapses, which is the connection from one neuron to another. And of course, those synapses. <coughs> Oh, I have a glass of water, and I thought I'd need this. <coughs> the synapses are not fixed, they're plastic. Um, they're not even fixed in location. Connections grow, connections die, neurons grow, neurons die. Um, but one of the weird things to think about is that everything you know is somehow captured in the way those connections are formed. Or at least that's, to the best of our knowledge, everything you know is captured in those connections. Um, the biology has incredibly good power efficiency. I, I've talked quite a lot about power efficiency. Um, but we don't have anything in electronics that comes close to the efficiency of biology. Um, one extreme example is if you imagine you knew how to build a complete computer model of the brain, the best estimates say you'd need one of our exascale computers to run it. And as I've mentioned, if, if, if we do an extremely good job that we don't know how to do, we'll get exascale down to about 10, 20 megawatts. Um, your brain does that on about 20 watts. So we have you know, six orders of magnitude between um, computation and the biology. Some of the secret there, I think, is in the next two bullets. So the brain is made of low performance components. Now, when I'm asked to build a fast computer, first thing I do is find the fastest components I can, and then I connect them together into the fastest serial engine I can, and then when all else fails, I throw in a bit of parallelism, because that's the bit I don't understand. Um, biology has clearly reversed this. It starts with low performance, extremely efficient components, and then uses parallelism to expand their capability in a way that we aren't close to understanding. But nothing inside your head works on time scales much shorter than a millisecond. Um, whereas the things in here are running on picosecond time scales. Um, likewise, the communication in your head, signals flow at the orders of a few meters per second, in some cases tens of meters per second. Um, whereas, you know, chip designers constantly complain about speed of light limitations, and how many clock cycles it takes to get from one side of a chip to the other. We're in a completely different scale of universe. And we know in computers that if you want to make it go faster, you nearly always sacrifice energy efficiency to go faster. What we haven't thought about very much is what happens if we go the other way. So if we really want to maximize energy efficiency, um, why don't we just make things much slower and then use lots of them? Of course, the, the one bunch of people who've done a fairly good job of thinking the other way are the people who build the processes that go inside these things. Okay, so this thing has a microprocessor inside it and it runs quite happily off a little solar cell which forms the face. Um, so it's running off minuscule levels of power. So these people understand what going in the other direction means, but, but the general computing community really hasn't thought about this at all. Um, then, of course, a feature of the biology is, it, is its ability to cope with component failure. Um, I'm informed that as you're sitting here listening to me, um, you're losing about one neuron a second, or at least that's the average component loss through the adult usable life of the brain. Um, and yet we don't really notice it, because the brain is very able to co cope with that level of component failure. I have no idea how to build machines like this that cope with random 1% component failures. Um, so <coughs> There was a jump, how I didn't explain. What, uh, one percent per second correspond, no, one neuron per second corresponds to about two percent of your total set of neurons over the useful life of your brain. So, so the brain will cope with one or two percent component failure um, without suffering any significant loss of functionality. If you get to 10 or 20 or 30 percent, you have a bit of a problem. That's, uh, that's not random component loss. And of course, brains learn in interesting ways that we, again, don't understand very well. But you see that, that given the sort of reliability problems we're facing in computer technology, there are suggestions that there might be solutions if we could understand the biology a bit better. And of course, the issue that we're now forced to deal with parallelism um, suggests there may be ideas in this space, which is why I've been pursuing this uh, for the last 10 years, 
generally driven by uh, these two headline questions, which is computers are getting faster at an impressive rate, and as they go parallel, they still get faster if you can use it. Um, can we use these big computers to build ever more realistic models of the brain that will help us understand how it works? Clearly, the computer model is not going to tell us how the brain works. Um, there's still enormous requirement for basic neuroscience, for psychology, for medical imaging and so on to look inside. It's just another instrument we can use to poke at the problem. Um, but it's a different instrument because you know, neuroscience tends to look at neurons in, in the very small. It looks at very small numbers. Uh, imaging tends to look at them in the very large numbers. And there's a whole range of scales in between where we currently don't have instruments that can probe what's happening. And we can build computer models that are highly probable in those intermediate regions. And in terms of the information processing function of the brain, I think most of the interesting action is in the middle there that we can't see from either end at the moment. Um, and then, of course, reflecting that back, as we understand more about the brain, can we use that to work out how to build better computers, coping with the unreliable technology that's coming our way um, and the parallelism that is inevitably coming our way. So um, here's my computer engineer's short summary of neuroscience. Um, I hope there aren't too many neuroscientists in the room. This is always a worrying point. Um, but neurons are you know, the logic gates of the brain. They're conveniently multiple input, single output devices like a logic gate. Um, and the difference is the scale. So logic gates usually have two, three, four inputs. Neurons usually have 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 inputs. So there's a difference of scale, but um, you can still understand them in a logic gate sense. And it's quite interesting, if you go back and look at some of the early papers by the likes of John von Neumann, you'll find that often in the papers, you can't, you can't tell whether he's talking about logic gates or neurons. He uses the same pictures for both. And, and he sees them as, as very equivalent. Um, since then, the two threads have diverged. Um, and, and the sort of sense of similarity has, has rather been lost. But it's interesting to go back and look at that again. Uh, neurons are useful across multiple scales, so there are animals that get by quite nicely with a few hundred. Um, C. elegans is 300 and something, I think. Um, seems to be quite successful as a species. Um, honeybees have 850,000 neurons in their brain, just under a million. Uh, we have 100 billion, and you can find everything across this range of scale. And the component is basically the same. Okay? So we're all working with the same bits, it's just we've got more of them. Um, and honeybee. So it's like logic gates, you can build simple things with a few and you can build complicated things with, with large numbers. Um, there's something to get hold of. Your, your head is not simply a pot into which 100 billion neurons are being poured at random and then you hope something emerges. Um, there's quite a lot of structure in there and the neuroscientists draw pictures that they talk about in, with familiar phrases such as microarchitecture. Um, so this is the, a drawing by a neuroscientist of a six-layer cortical microarchitecture. Um, it looks like a schematic, you know, I'm an engineer, I look at this, I think, well, if they know that, that makes quite a lot of sense. Um, when you go and look at the detail, you'll find it's nearly all not there. Um, so in, in a real circuit schematic, you expect to be able to find every connection down to gate level, and that's just not true at uh, present in neuroscience, although it is becoming truer at quite an impressive rate. The techniques are now being developed to map you know, the entire receptive field of neurons, building statistical models of how many connections are made in certain regions. So we're, we're, we're approaching schematics, but we're not quite there. But there is this regularity. And, and what's kind of, well, in, what intrigues me is that this structure in the cortex it's pretty similar at the back of the head, where it does things we sort of understand, low-level image processing and so on. And at the front of the head, where it's doing things we haven't a clue about, such as natural language processing and higher-level thinking. But the basic architecture looks the same. And that strongly suggests there are algorithmic similarities. Um, but we really don't know what they are. 
at all. And, and of course, I'm guessing at this point. Um, so here's a sort of random input on, 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 on the kind of things that computational neuroscientists play with. Um, people have spent a lot of time and effort trying to understand how synapses adapt to their environment, how they learn effectively. And one of the current favorite models is a thing called spike timing dependent plasticity, um, which is often drawn as a double exponential curve, although if you look at the biological data from which this is derived, um, to me it looks more like somebody has sort of taken a two barrel shotgun and opened one barrel in the top left quadrant and one in the bottom right, and then drawn a very clean exponential through this rather random set of data points. Uh, but biology is a bit like that, I understand. Um, the only basic thing you need to understand from this graph is that the synapse connects two neurons. If the presynaptic neuron spikes and then the postsynaptic neuron spikes, so there's a causal relationship in the path through the synapse, <coughs> this is a good thing, and the synapse gets stronger. And if the reverse happens, so there's an anti-causal relationship between presynaptic and postsynaptic spikes, then the synapse gets depressed. Okay, so it, it's Causal good, anti-causal bad, is, is the simple model uh, that STDP captures. Um, and there's, there's reasonably good biological evidence um, that this is happening at least in some synapses. And um, this very simple learning rule, causality good, anti-causality bad, can, can do some surprising things. Um, so here's a typical raster plot. The, the x-axis is time. The y-axis is just enumerating a population of 200 neurons, and each spot on there corresponds to a neuron spiking. So you know, this spot is neuron number 31 spiking at time 640 milliseconds. Um, and these raster plots are quite common ways of presenting uh, uh, neuroscience data that's been produced by simulations anyway. Um, now, there is a repeated pattern in here. Okay? And you may or may not be able to spot it. I, if I give you long enough, you'll probably spot it. Okay. Um, but anyway, here, this makes it a bit easier. Okay. Uh, each neuron enumerated on the vertical axis is producing an independent Poisson train of spikes, except somebody has taken a little region in the bottom half and cut and pasted it in across this pattern. So, that, so artificially, there is a repeated pattern embedded in what's otherwise a random background. And if you connect these 200 neurons into uh, a single detector neuron uh, through synapses that follow this STDP rule, causality good, anti-causality bad, then what Mescalier and Thorpe showed is really quite interesting, which is without any external training input, so there's no reward or any other function going on here, just the, statist the statistics of the input, the neuron spots the repeated pattern, picks it out, and then tracks back, and actually ends up firing, it's in the case of a single neuron, it ends up firing fairly early in the repeated pattern, very consistently. And so if you imagine um, a newborn brain, you open, the baby opens its eyes, it sees various scenes, these scenes have statistics, those statistics immediately start affecting um, the first regions of the brain in the visual pathways, um, assuming their plasticity is enabled at that time. And I mean, one of the magic things in, in brain development is, is, is when plasticity isn't and is and isn't enabled. Um, but you can see that, you, that you know, you're extracting statistics. You're doing something that's uh, very much akin to <coughs> statistical machine learning with, with nothing more sophisticated than this simple causality mechanism. Um, now, those are the kinds of things that, that computational neuroscientists play with quite a lot to try and understand um, what might be happening as the brain does whatever it does. In my group at Manchester, we're computer engineers, so what we set about um, building was a machine that's specialized 
in this job of running these uh, computational neuroscience models, particularly ones based on spiking neurons. And it's very clear when you look at the problem that it's a big problem, so you need lots of compute power to do it. Um, so the requirement is for a scalable architecture. That's very clear at the outset. And what we're building is a machine where our goal is to put about a million R <coughs> processors together in a single box, all uh, coordinated in running the same biological models in real time. So our goal is to deliver computational models that run in biological real time, which is something you can't currently achieve even on a high-end supercomputer. Okay. Um, and I'll explain how we do that. Now, a million processors, why a million processors? Well, it's a big number, it's a nice round number. Um, a million processors only gets you about 1% of the scale of the human brain. So we're a long way off, you know, whole brain models. Although I believe it's 10 mice or something. We could probably do a whole mice with a fraction of the machine, if anybody knew what a whole mouse's brain looks like, which they don't. Um, but it's, it's just trying to see what we can do by way of pushing the technology at this problem. And of course, modeling spiking neurons is an example of an embarrassingly parallel problem, and therefore we don't have to worry about the difficulties that I outlined earlier of general purpose parallel processing. Uh, this one's easy, right, in terms of parallel processing. To build a sort of fairly flexible generic machine, um, one thing we didn't want to do was specialize to a particular part of the brain. So the idea is whatever neural network you want to model, you can map it onto the machine. So we've decoupled the topology of the network you want to model from the topology of the machine itself. The machine is a boring 2D mesh, um, but you can model a 3D network or you can model a network in 100 dimensions if that's what you want. All that we promise is wherever you chuck the neurons in the machine, we will connect spikes from one to any other um, in significantly less than a millisecond, because that means they're instantaneous in biological time. The machine embodies the principles I've already outlined, so um, we don't like synchronization, and in the standard models there is no machine-wide synchronization. Everything just runs in its own local view of time. Um, neurons spike when they want to spike. When spikes arrive, they have to cope. Um, and basically time models itself, which means we don't have to pass timestamps around. And of course, energy efficiency is, is uh, at the top of the agenda. Um, so what have we built? This is, this is where we get a bit hardware-y. Um, we built a big two-dimensional mesh of nodes. Each node contains two chips. They happen to be in the same package, so it looks like a, an array of packages. But one chip is the Spinnaker chip that we've designed, and that's occupied most of our resource um, to date. And there's also a, um, a DRAM chip in there, the memory that contains the synaptic data. Um, because big memories is something the industry knows how to make very well. What's inside the Spinnaker chip? Well, the node is uh, mainly unsurprising. There's a row of processors across the middle that happen to have enough local resources to model you know, order a thousand neurons each. Um, there's a bunch of housekeeping stuff at the bottom of the picture um, where they share access to this off-chip memory. And th the key is at the top of the picture where there's the communications infrastructure, where what we've built is effectively just a very lightweight packet switch fabric. And when a neuron spikes, that generates a packet the packet simply identifies the neuron that just spiked, and it's dropped into the fabric, and then the fabric carries that packet to everywhere it needs to go. So it's a, a multicast communications protocol routed by the address of the neuron that spiked. Um, and the packets are very small, and that's basically the key. Okay, so the, 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 the standard packets we ship around are 40 bits, or 5 bytes. Um, there's an option for a longer packet, I'll, I'll say more about that later. But it's this communications that enables us to achieve the real time. And, you know, if you like chip pictures, people who spent their life designing chips love chip pictures, and everybody else hasn't a clue what I'm talking about. Uh, but this thing on the right here is what we spent five years and about 40 man years of resource, generously funded by EDSRC, 
Um, it took about 40 man years to put this tiny thing together. Um, you know, in the chip design business, I, you know, I usually like to compare notes with other people on the basis of the number of PhDs per square millimeter. Um, I find that's a good metric. Yeah. I shall bring the ref round to this fairly soon. The same metric we use for space allocation. We've put it in a package. You can see in the top left there the spinning chip is about a square centimeter, it's sitting at the bottom, and the DRAM chip is just glued on top, and then metal wire bonding is used to connect them together inside the package. So we end up with a complete node looking like the chip in the bottom left corner. And, and that's the basic thing we used to build systems from. And we got the first of those chips um, in July last year. So we've had the hardware for a little over a year. Um, the key component of the architecture is how we do this interconnect. And we need to get the very high connectivity of biological systems um, mapped into a straightforward and simple communications mechanism that, that will deliver what's required. Um, in the neuromorphic computing community, which are people who like building analog electronic models of neurons, they've come up with an approach to sending spikes around <coughs> called address event representation. <coughs> well, basically, it's broadcast the idea of the neuron that just spiked. And this is address event representation mapped into a packet switch fabric. Okay, that's all it is. Um, so we have a 32-bit event ID, which means we've got an address space of up to 4 billion neurons, which is four times the number we can sensibly model with the size of the machine we're building. And then there's a header that does some tedious housekeeping. Um, <coughs> we also overlay on that more conventional communication protocols for, for operating system and management functions. So point-to-point -point is what you normally see or understand in networks where you specify the destination and the packet finds its way there somehow. Um, nearest neighbor is an interesting one. Chips can actually talk to their immediate neighbors with, with a specific protocol, and they can do more than send them packets. They can actually fertile around their innards. So a, a processor on this chip can actually address peripherals inside that chip. And this means if this chip <coughs> doesn't boot properly, we can kind of nurse it from next door. And with nearest neighbor, we also get um, a machine boot and load time which is independent of its size. So we can basically, you know, the requirement I gave the team was <coughs> the Spinnaker machine with a million processors has to boot faster than my laptop. Okay. Now at the time this was a fairly easy challenge because I had a laptop that ran Microsoft Vista. Um, <laughs> I cheated a bit and I've come to a Mac so now the challenge is much tougher. Um, but anyway, the, the, we, we have flood fill mechanisms that make all this work very quickly. Um, that's probably as much as I've got time to do. How do we route these things? I mean, the, the, the sort of the key to delivering these packets is knowing how to route them. And clearly, what we can't have each chip has a router on. Packets arrive, they pass through the router, they get sent out to many places. Um, what we clearly can't do is have a table that has two to the 32 entries in it because physically that is just infeasible. And, and what we do is just invert the problem. So the, the routing is done by an associative router based on a ternary CAM, a three-state CAM, that just pattern matches the 32-bit ID in the, in the incoming packet, matches it against a set of stored templates, and if it finds a match, it then sends it out through the row of outputs, and we have one bit per outgoing link <coughs> and one bit per local processor. And that packet can be routed to any or all of those, any subset. Um, the obvious question here is, well, so how big does this table have to be? And the fact we've made it ternary means it has sort of don't care properties, so you can use logic compression on, on the tables. But perhaps more importantly, characteristic of these networks is you don't c connect individual neurons to individual targets. Um, you, you tend to think of neurons in populations, and you connect populations to other populations. And a population to population projection can be handled by a single table entry by um, appropriate use of the don't care capabilities. And we also have various other default mechanisms to reduce table size. So, in fact, what we've implemented is each chip has a thousand entry 
associative table for doing the routing, and we have yet to find the network that uses more than 100 of those 1,000 entries. So, um, so far, it seems to work. But, uh, I, I can easily de de design a pathological network that breaks the, breaks the routing table structure. But biology doesn't seem to be that pathological. So the, the basic mapping problem is you take a network, as shown on the left here, where each of those circles represents a population of hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of neurons. Um, and you map those neurons onto processors in some way, and then you build tables that capture the projections that are shown as the lines between the circles. And that particular network maps onto this machine with um, three entries per table. So the, the mapping is quite efficient. And if you look at the overall problem you're trying to solve, one of the sort of slightly odd things about Spinnaker is you start <coughs> off very early on, you split your problem into two halves. Um, the algorithms you want to run on the processors, which are compiled into conventional code and run along the bottom of this picture, and the topology of the problem, how these processes connect to each other, which are mapped along, along the top. <coughs> and one of the key points is that when a processor issues a message, it has no idea where it's going. Okay? The processor simply says, this neuron here spiked, sort it out. And then that, the identity of the neuron that spiked is understood by the routing fabric, which then carries that packet to the necessary thousand targets or whatever you need. So um, what this gives us is a machine which in at its full scale, um, in sort of high performance computing terms, has a bisection bandwidth in the region of 10 billion packets a second. So we can, which corresponds effectively to a billion neurons modeled on the machine, each firing at 10 hertz and each having one connection on the other half of the machine, which is an extremely pathological um, topology for a model. Uh, biological systems have quite a lot of locality in their connectivity graphs. So the, the bisection bandwidth is not very impressive in terms of bits per second. Okay. Uh, there are lots of supercomputers that will shuffle data much faster than this. Um, but they won't shuffle more packets than this. And, and so it's the lightweight fabric and the small packets that make the machine tuned to this problem. And um, so far I've muttered mainly about hardware. Um, You'll realize there's a little bit of software involved in this project too. Getting this machine to do anything is quite exciting. Um, and the balance of work in the group has shifted from two or three years ago where you know, it was 80% hardware, 20% software. It's now about 90% software and 10% hardware. So um, we've had a big shift in emphasis. Um, the software is very simple. The core software that we run on the machine is very simple. It's, it's event driven for energy efficiency. So the base state of all processors is asleep doing nothing, using as little power as possible. Then when something happens, they wake up processing and go back to sleep again. Um, and the three things that happen in a typical neural model are a packet arrives, which means an incoming spike has landed. Um, that triggers access to the off-chip memory. When that's completed, that produces its own event. That DMA stands for direct memory access, which is just an engine that does the, the memory transfers. And then something happens that updates the synapses. And independently and asynchronously, there is a timer event which typically runs at a millisecond, and that just runs an Euler differential equation solver um, that integrates the, the neuron characteristics millisecond by millisecond and may generate more spikes going out. Um, we have built a slightly higher level uh, infrastructure that, that provides us a, a C level API for programming the machine. And there are some people who want to do weird other things than modern neurons <coughs> on it. Um, so we've given them a reason friendly programming interface, but it's very low level. Okay, the, one of the restrictions if you want to program Spinnaker is that every processor has exactly 32 kilobytes of code space. Okay? Um, so we want people who are more used to programming Manchester baby machines than Microsoft operating systems. Um, 
But as I point out to any student who complains about what can I possibly do in 32 kilobytes, I generally get out my trusty BBC Micro and show them elite. Right. That's what you can do in 32 kilobytes uh, in the galactic space trading games. Um, so so that, that's the system model. I don't have much time to talk about it. In fact, I'm over time already. Um, we build tools so that the neuroscientists can use languages they understand. So neuroscientists like to code their networks in languages such as Pine, Nest, Lens. Lens is a psychologist language. Did you know that psychologists use different, completely different sorts of neural networks from neuroscientists? It's one of the mysteries that's been revealed. <coughs> and, and then we've automated the flow. So if you have a Pine description that runs on your laptop, um, we have a set of tools that basically does the mapping onto the machine and gives you an executable model at the bottom end um, as automatically as possible. Um, we focus mainly on Pine um, as, the, as the language we support and when you map this thing and run it you can get uh, the sort of traces out that I generally describe as looking like every figure in every computational neuroscience paper you've ever looked at. Um, I'm sure there's deep meaning inside there somewhere. Um, one of the great mysteries of building neural network engines is how do you know they're working? I mean, how do you know they're doing anything sensible? And um, if you build computers, people want to know that they can trust the answers, so we, we need to do some comparisons. And these curves show leaky integrated fire neurons computed on Nest, Brian, and Spinnaker, all doing pretty much the same. Um, Isikavich neurons, these are <coughs> bifurcating dynamical system models of neurons, which are quite popular at the moment. Um, again, we can compute those. And here, Spinnaker and Brian seem to do exactly the same thing, or pretty close. There are slight differences because Spinnaker is a fixed point machine. We have no floating point support on the machine. Um, so we're training people to know how big their operands are for a change. Um, that's fine at, at the, you know, the level of individual membrane potentials. But once models get complicated, neural systems are generally a bit chaotic. So, so you can't expect things to converge at a fine level of detail. Um, so at a higher level, here's a population of 500 neurons doing in, in a particular benchmark configuration doing something completely incomprehensible. It's another raster plot. <coughs> the dots clearly don't line up exactly. Um, but if you plot something like the mean activity of these populations, then you see it's rising in steps and, and the two models track to what you might think is acceptable um, accuracy. Okay? So there's lots of randomness in this, but, the, the, but there are average behaviors that seem to track. So you might say, okay, I trust that, that looks right enough. This isn't a problem you need to spin it, by the way. The, if you talk to the computational neuroscientists, you'll find one of their complaints is that they have models and they can never get the same answer from any two simulators. Okay, they run the same model on different simulators and always get different answers. Um, or you can take it to an even higher level and connect your neural network to a robot, and here is an advantage of the fact that we run everything in real time. So we can do real-time robotics, and that's a robot's I view of a line on the floor, which it's trying to follow. And there indeed is said robot. It has a silicon retina on the front, which is from, I think this one's from Seville, um, Bernabe's group in Seville. Um, this is a retina that produces spikes as its native input output um, protocol. And those spikes are being fed over a wireless network onto a Spinnaker card where there's this very simple control neural network that's telling the robot which way to go. This is not a significant, <coughs> excuse me, not a significant advance in robotics. In fact, there are much easier ways to solve this problem in robotics. Um, but it's just showing you know, the robot follows the line. So in some sense, the network is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, right, so a bit of wrap up. Um, where are we up to? Well. All that stuff was done on very small machines with four Spinnaker nodes. We're now building, we've built circuit boards with bigger hexagonal arrays of these chips, and we're just beginning to experiment with these. And these are the basic components that will be the basis for the bigger machines. So, um, hexagons, mapping hexagons onto toroids is great fun. I recommend it as a mental exercise. 
Um, and then mapping the hexagons onto sensible circuit boards is another interesting challenge. But the Spinnaker boards, which you'll see, um, look like this. We've, we've had these for a couple of months now, and, and this is a board with 48 nodes. That's 864 ARM processors on this circuit board. And it runs off about, well, between 20 and 60 watts, depending on how hard it's working. So it's quite, you know, it's 1,000 processors for circa 50 watts if they're working fairly hard. Um, it's, it is a hexagon. Um, it looks like it's a square, but in fact, if you look carefully, you can see there aren't 49 there, there are only 48. And one of the challenges for people who like mapping hexagons onto toroids um, is you get to 48 if you start with a kernel of three hexagons and then add layers. 48 is one of the numbers you hit. And so the question, the exercise for the students tonight is why do we start with three instead of one? So if you start with one and then wrap layers around, you get a, a different series of numbers. Um, and we chose not to do that, and we had a kind of good reason. Um, the grand plan is to build big machines. The final machine will occupy 10 cabinets. It'll be quite a ferocious piece of kit compared with anything we've built before. It's a, it's a, it's a million processors for about 90 kilowatts. Um, and we have a series of machines planned in the grant imaginatively called the 103, 104, 105, and 106 machines, where the interpretation is the 103 machine has about 10 to the 3 processors. Okay. The 104 has about 10 to the 4. So in fact, the 103 is one of those circuit cards and has about 10 to the 3, where about is 864. Um, and then we put these in racks and put the racks in cabinets. And uh, we're just beginning to sort of populate a rack with, with these boards going from the 103 to the 104 machine. And then if we put five of those in the cabinet, we have enough computing resource to do a network of the scale of a mouse brain. Um, <coughs> of course, we're using quite simple neural models. We're, we're tending to the point neuron end of complexity. So if you're a thoroughbred biologist, you'll object we're oversimplifying already. Um, so we've got the chips. We built a series of cards and models. We have various bits of software running. We've now got the 48 chip board, and, and over the next year, we're just sort of building these up into bigger and bigger machines, and continuing to put a lot of resource into developing the software to make these usable. Um, so, slightly over time, apologies. Um, Brains are a big computational challenge. They're a huge driver for, for understanding how to build big, usable parallel computers. But they're now in sight. They're tantalizingly close to what we can now build in computer terms. You know, exascale machines are the next target for high-performance computing. Exascale is about where you need to be in order to talk about whole human brain scale models. Um, Spinnick is an attempt to kind of finesse this, and I think what we've learned is that even if you had an exascale machine, you probably couldn't do it in real time because of the communication structure that high performance computers tend to have. Um, so we've, we've improved on that a bit. So the, the major architectural innovation is the way we do the communications. And the machine has lots of self tuning features and fault tolerance features that I haven't really talked about much. Um, so when you build a machine this big, bits are going to drop off. Inevitable, and therefore you have to keep running. Um, but this is built on a fairly reliable under, underpinning technology, so we don't expect lots of small failures, we expect a small number of bigger failures. Um, and we've got things working, and it's available <coughs> to play with if you have interesting challenges you think the machine would suit. Uh, do let us know. Um, lots of people have contributed to this. My team in Manchester um, is about 20 people. And this is, in fact, the second generation of PhD students. I've already worn one lot out um, doing the hardware, and I'm now busily wearing the second lot out doing the software. Um, we have collaborators in Southampton, and we also have collaborators in, in Cambridge and Sheffield who've yet to supply me with a suitable photograph for including them on the final slide of my talk. So at that point, I'll stop. Um, I'm quite happy to take questions. Uh, but thank you for, for listening. And so who organizes questions here or do I just stand well um, take them as they come? Yeah. Everybody wants to
wants to get home. Yeah. Uh, you took a uh, bio-inspired approach using low-powered processors and paralyzing the whole thing. But uh, what stops you from taking this to extreme using very, very small processors like a neuron or a synapse and paralyzing the communication as well using dedicated wires for each axon or for each dendrite? What stops you from doing that? So th the idea that we might have gone to even smaller and more efficient processes, of course, is, is the logical corollary of the argument I placed earlier about, about merits of biology. Um, one's always constrained in engineering by what's actually practical, what you can lay your hands on. Um, and if you went to much smaller processes, then you probably need quite a lot more silicon. Um, and the cost, the cost would go up because the cost is proportional to silicon. One of the frightening statistics is the full spinning of a machine <coughs> will have 10 square meters of silicon in it. <laughs> so that's a, that's a big microchip. Um, that's 10 square meters of active surface. On the communication, um, trying to wire individual neurons together is the thing that's actually flawed all, all earlier attempts to build these kinds of parallel neural systems. Because you just can't get the wiring density. Um, and that's because basically all the silicon processing is in two dimensions. So you only have two dimensions to wire it, whereas the brain has three. Um, the trade-off you can make is that the, ele the electrical wires are very much faster than the biological wires. So you can effectively get the connectivity through multiplexing stuff down the same wires. That, that's what we do, we multiplex it. But if we don't multiplex it, we can use much lower frequencies on yeah. those wires, and then maybe we can integrate more wires into space. But you, you, you've got to physically make the wires. Yes. Okay. And getting, <coughs> getting wires on and off chips is very messy. Uh, um, the number of input-output connections you can make on a chip well, is... What, what if we put sedimentary. everything on one <coughs> uh, wafer-scale chip? But I've said it, this is 10 square meters. Okay. A wafer is about... Mm. That about the biggest wafers are currently 30 centimeter diameter. Um, so they are yeah, less than a tenth of a square meter. So we need a hundred wafers. So being in two dimensions is the main bottleneck here. Yes, and and the physical engineering of wires. So when you when you need to go off the silicon onto a, onto some substrate the size of connection you need to make that connection is quite big. I mean the, the, the closest you can put bond wires around the edge of a chip is around 50 micron spacing. So you can get about 20 wires to the millimeter. And that's very poor density compared with. 3D stacking doesn't help with that. Um, 3D stacking helps locally. And, um, you know, we're, we're talking about what we do for a second generation um, within the context of the Human Brain Project, which is this EU ICT flagship mark. Um, and their 3D stacking plays a very big role. Um, but it doesn't solve the neuron to neuron wiring problem between chips, it just solves them within a single stack. Take another question. Um, I was hearing recently that. Uh, are more others have been talking about individual processors, which are a sort of a, a less than a millimeter cubed. On the other hand, I don't know how they actually communicate with anything. Uh, can one do anything with these? Uh, how would they communicate? Um, I, I mean, ARM is just a processor. Um, there's been talk, I mean, the, the Berkeley Smart Dust project is, is aiming to build sensors which have a, a, sort of milli, a millimeter cube dimension yeah. for all the processing and the radio comms and the power source and everything. Now, that's not been achieved yet. Okay. Um, but you can communicate over short distances by radio <coughs> with, with quite a small physical size. I'm not an antenna expert. But, but presumably, you could never get the sort of consistent activity with those things that you need for your type of process? Um, 
um, never is always too strong a word for this kind of thing, but yes, I mean, the, 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 you know, one of the ideas of building a parallel machine is build radio communicating little, little modules and just fill a skip with them and let them get on with it. Um, whether you can ever get them to self-organize sufficiently effectively, I'm not sure. And the problem with radio, with, if you use radio comms, effectively you've only got one channel out of the node. Whereas um, you know, on, on, on these packages we have uh, potentially up to 300 interconnects, each of which is an independent channel. My, my question is about the difference between the biology of things and uh, your technical <coughs> implementation. Of, um, I'm not really sure, but I think neurons have a sort of a, a minimum uh, point of after, after which they fire. But I think that they're under constant um, potential. They have a certain electric potential. Does this, that mean that when you move it over to the technical side, when you can only have zeros and ones, there's no fu fuzzy logic. You can't move anywhere between those values. Is that the right way to scale up from a neuron to a processor? Well, um, okay. So, so, so you're you're you're, you're arguing about the distinction between an analog biological process and a digital computer process, and and and, and there are differences. Um, but I mean, the, the, the general theory here is if you model with enough accuracy, then the differences get lost in the noise. Okay, so all of these things operate in a noisy environment. And as long as the errors in your digital approximation are small compared to the noise, um, then you should be able to reproduce the same behavior. Now, there is a lot of interest. There's, an, there's a whole neuromorphic community out there who build their neural models with analog electronics. So they kind of, uh, they're closer to the biology in that sense. Um, and there are big debates on the right way to do this. But my current argument is that when you build an analog neural model, you're kind of deciding what's important and what to leave out once and for all. And one of the fundamental questions in, in computational neuroscience is how much of the biological complexity do you need to embrace and how much can you ignore because it's not relevant to information processing? And that question is unanswered. And, and one of the merits of having a software model is you can change your mind. So we haven't committed to a particular neural model. We've left, we, we've optimized for a certain subspace of possible neural models. So we haven't committed to a single model. In fact, on Spinnaker, it's entirely conceivable that you can, you can build heterogeneous models. So you can have spiking neurons over here running BG integrated fire. One's over here running Izzy Kavich because you want a little bit more accurate dynamics. And things over there that's just modeled as software modules um, where you've abstracted the neurons out altogether and just modeling behavior in software. Um, but one view of Spinnaker is it's a kind of prototyping machine where you work out what the problem is you really want to solve in analog electronics next. Probably better make this the last question. Um, you you discussed a bit in your presentation at the beginning about developing system which actually will cope with uh, an unreliable environment and, and loss of neurons, for instance. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea how you can use this concept in your system? If, for instance, some of your ships were starting to die, what's going to happen? Is your system is able to cope with that? Um, it's in the plan. Okay. Um, so the plan has all sorts of grand ideas about um, about how you recover from faults at runtime. Um, we haven't got to the scale of system where we've had to implement any of that yet, and some of it's quite hard. Um, so th there are bits of state. If, if you have a, a process of fail, basically go out of communication. It has local state that you then can't access. Okay, so you've got to reconstruct its role in the model with less than complete information. Um, and these are things we plan to do, but uh, they're, they're in the future at the moment. The, there's quite a lot of low-level hardware fault tolerance in the machine. So, for example, the chip has 18 processors on, but we will accept production chips that only have 17 working processors. Okay, so we, we use one bit of the fault tolerance just to get the manufacturing cost down. 
Um, we have uh, various levels of redundancy in the communication. The link goes down, there's an automatic hardware mechanism that reroutes down a different route. Um, so we've, we, we've put uh, the, the sort of various bits of error detection and recovery mechanisms all over, but we've yet to really use a lot of that in anger. The, the only time we use one in anger, I've got time to say, it's a slightly amusing, funny story. The first prototype test boards we got built with four nodes on, the manufacturer had real trouble getting the BGA board rid erased to attach to the circuit boards. We had lots of bad connections. And uh, so we got all those boards working, but they all effectively had different connectivity patterns. So we did use some of our fault tolerance capabilities much earlier than we planned to, <laughs> uh, to get those boards working. Um, so that's kind of reassuring that we got away with that. 